Rookie season is here. We are back for another Superflex mock draft, getting you ready for those all-important drafts as we approach May, running you through the key names and the key players you need to be looking out for as we get closer towards that all-important draft season. Hello and welcome to the Fantasy Sanctuary. We have got another banger for you today. I'm joined by the fantastic Jay Stein, who is a contributor over at Football Guys and the Devi Royale. Jay, how, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm I'm in uh, Columbus, Ohio. It's it's snowing pretty good today. Uh, we've had a little bit of warmer weather, but it's you know it's, it's coming down pretty hard today. So um, getting a little cold here, but uh, but doing good, doing good. I'd, I'd, I'd take cold and snow over five degrees of rain, which is basically all we seem to get every single day. So, uh, so yeah, it's, I'm very jealous, put it that way. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're going to have a, a two-round rookie mock. Uh, we're going to go super flex. Um, and, yeah, as as you're the guest, Jay, I'm going to hand the baton over to you and, and let you have the, the 101. Yeah, and it's it's great to see um, the last show you I think you were doing it in Excel. Um, yes. It's great to see that we now have it in Sleeper. Um, I don't know about the rest of your listener base, but I've been in doing as many of these mock drafts as I can. So uh, if you ever want to do one, you just reach out to me on Twitter and and we can get in one. Um, yeah, it's it's very first exciting one, to have real, real I know. actually a draft platform rather than having to try and work it on Excel. I know it's, it's, it's awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, the first pick I'm going to go with Caleb Williams uh, for for pick one here. This is this is a super flex, so QBs are um, important. I do think that the pick comes down to from from my perspective, it comes down to Caleb Williams and Marvin Harrison. So those would be the two that that I would um, be looking to consider there um, because of the uh, positional value of the super flex um, uh, league format. I think Caleb takes the notch. Uh, above Marvin Harrison, even though Marvin Harrison to me feels like the safest m- maybe prospect. Um, Caleb uh, is a, a darn good prospect. And and last year, if I had a tier zero, I would have said B. John Robinson and nobody else in that tier. This year, if I have a tier zero, which is, you know, that just sort of upper end above kind of tier one, I think it, I think it's Caleb Williams and Marvin Harrison. So I think depending on the league format or, you know, like how the league's shaping up, I think you can switch one versus two but I, I think for most of the drafts that I would I would prefer to see Caleb Williams go at, at, at uh, position one Caleb Williams to me is uh, one, a, a very excellent QB prospect and and he is an early declare um, three-year player that has done every met every um, analytical thing that I look for for all three of those years. And yes, year three was a little bit of disappointment, but when you actually dive into the numbers and you're looking at age adjusted thresholds, he's still meeting all those thresholds. And I still think he's going to be a pretty great NFL fantasy quarterback. Now where he goes, that'll be a, that'll be a a huge uh, um, decision process throughout this whole draft period. I think if I had to guess, he's probably that first overall pick to probably the Chicago bears. And what happens with Justin Fields after that, we're not sure. But if I was guessing and doing the draft right now, I'd say he probably goes first overall, and that is probably to the Chicago Bears, um, who have a new offensive coordinator um, and maybe uh, an exciting place for him for him to go. So um, right now, yeah, I'm going to go with Caleb Williams at one. No, I think he's a fantastic pick. He's you know a fantastic player. The the upside, the ceiling is phenomenal. I think. You know, you, you listen to anyone talk about it. His ability to create out of structure is like very few prospects we've ever seen. Um, one question I I keep getting asked, and I'm intrigued to hear your thought process on this. If you're sitting at the 101, but you're okay at the quarterback position, say you've got, you know, a superstar and then maybe, I know Jared Goff is your QB2. Are you taking Caleb Williams at 101? Are you taking Marvin Harrison? Or are you looking to move back to 102 and, and try and get something on top? If this is super flex, I want the two superstar QBs. And I think Caleb Williams gets me into that two superstar QB range. Um, and then the Jared Goff is the the 
guy that I can plug in and use during the bye week. Um, but no, I, I, I want the that competitive advantage you get in the Superfex um, leagues where you have two super superstar um, quarterbacks um, each in those positions. But I do think, though, say you had like um, – you had two superstar quarterbacks that would be, that would get me into the, the situation where then I would be okay. Maybe um, taking the Marvin Harrison. So let's say I have um, Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert, then I'm okay passing on Caleb Williams and going Marvin Harrison. But the, the, the scenario you laid out was superstar quarterback and then Jared Goff who can get you enough points, but I don't think he's that superstar level quarterback enough for me to, to move off of taking Kayla Williams at one. No, makes makes a lot of sense. So I'm up at the 102. Um, I'm going to go go with chalk. Unfortunately, I'm going to go Marvin Harrison. I think that I talked about this on the show with Pat. For me, he is probably the safest prospect we've seen from a fantasy perspective in, I think, probably seven or eight years. Like, I've got no questions about him transitioning. I think he's a big body guy impressive fruit runner, incredible hands. We know that the, the lineage is there. You know, obviously, Dad was a superstar in the league. I think that wherever he goes, he's going to be that number one target option on basically any offense in the league. And I'm really excited about what he could be. And I think that it's rare that you're going to have a guy that's got this potential upside. You know, we're already talking about him maybe as a top five, top six dynasty wide receiver. And you can get him at the 102. It's absolutely incredible. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've got very few concerns, and I think it's a, a smash pick here at the 102. I love that pick. Um, I, I agree. I think uh, Marvin Harrison is one of the safest dynasty picks that you can make in this draft, if not the safest. Um, and he smashed for two years uh, and, and deserves to be in that upper tier of wide receivers. So, yeah, I love that pick at two. And uh, now it feels like this is where the draft begins at 103. Uh, so, uh, so put us all out of our, uh, our misery as we wait with bated breath. And uh, where are you going to go here? Yeah, for me, it's between uh, one of the quarterbacks and another wide receiver that I have in the Marvin Harrison Jr. tier. Um, and so I'm going to go with Drake May here uh, for my third pick. Perfect. For, the third, I... for the third pick, my second pick. Um, and... Uh, to me, there's this. Uh, there's another wide receiver that's up in the Marvin Harrison tier that I do think can, you can go here at three um, besides Drake May. But uh, again, this is super flex, and I want to kind of live towards towards that theme. I, I think Drake May um, has is uh, a, a top five draft pick in the NFL draft this this year, um, and it's going to go to a team that needs a QB to play right away. So I, I do think that he'll he'll probably be playing next year, um, and I think that his his college profile is 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 a great profile. Now, uh, the the way that I separate Drake May and and Caleb Williams is the fact that Caleb Williams did it for three years and Drake May did it for two years. But both of those guys meet all most of the, most of the age adjusted thresholds that I'm looking for at the QB position. So the uh, early declares, high first round picks. Um, crushing uh, uh, most of these analytics that I'm looking for, uh, uh, QBR, EPA per play, adjusted yards per attempt, rush yards, um, smashing all these things. Uh, I, I think it's a it's a pretty good um, um, a pick to take Drake May here at three, but I think there's a, another, another player uh, in my wide receiver ranks that's at that level. So I could have gone either way with Drake May or, or that next wide receiver. Yeah, I, I love the Drake May pick. I'm I'm currently Drake May over Caleb Williams in terms of how I've got it ranked. So yeah, I, I think he's a smash here. I love him. I think in terms of prototypical size, arm strength, you know, he can I, I hate using the phrase, but he can make every NFL throw. I think as well, he's kind of being forgotten about in terms of his rushing ability. Now, I don't think he's going to be, you know, in the Lamar, Kyler, Jane Hurts world, probably not in the world of another prospect maybe we'll talk about shortly. But I think he's got sneaky rushing upside. I think he could be in that Justin Herbert, Trevor Lawrence, kind of Aaron Rodgers in his heyday where he's getting three, 
maybe 400 rushing yards, maybe three or four, maybe five touchdowns. And it's enough that, yeah, he's not a true kind of Kunami code, but he's giving you enough that it's not a massive detriment at that position. And I think that as a pocket passer, for me, he's the safest quarterback prospect in this draft. I think that for me, his floor is so much higher than any quarterback in this draft because I think Caleb Williams, whilst I think he's probably going to be a better NFL quarterback, there is a world where, you know, his reliance on creating out of structure almost is his detriment. And I think that Drake May's ability to work from the pocket allows him to be a competent NFL starter, I think almost as his worst case scenario as such. So um, I am going to go back to the wide receiver position. Um, I am going to go Malik Neighbours here. I think that, man, I, I, I just really enjoy watching his tape. He is so much fun to watch. I think any other year we'd be talking about him as the superstar. It's just that it's one of these years where he's behind Marvin Harrison, and, and so he's not getting the hype. Great all-round play raker, elite route runner, ability to be used both out of the slot as a flanker, as a split end. He's phenomenal with the ball in his hands as well, and he's a guy that, you know, can basically take any ball to the house at any point. And I'm really excited about what he could be at the next level, and I think he's one of these guys that, you know, if you're sitting there with, the 104 in rookie drafts and you could come away with a guy like Malik Neighbors, it's it's hard not to be really excited. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm really excited about Malik Neighbors. Um, Malik Neighbors had an absolutely fantastic season. Um, you could even say he had a better season than than Marvin Harrison Jr. did this year. Um, the and and they both uh Marvin Harrison got on the field a little bit this his freshman year, but Marvin Harrison Jr.'s real breakout year was his second year, and it was it was fantastic. It was phenomenal. Um, uh, Malik Neighbors had a really good um, year too. Uh, it meet all met all the age adjusted thresholds, but it just wasn't quite as good as Marvin Harrison Jr.'s. And then if you go into the third third year, Malik Neighbors, they both were very very good, but Malik Neighbors edged out Marvin Harrison Jr. in a lot of categories this year. So I think. I think really, um, you know, there's there's a third and maybe even fourth wide receiver that people want to put into this category of Marvin Harrison and Malik Neighbors. I think there's Marvin Harrison and Malik Neighbors are in a, a, a higher category than the rest of the, the pack. Um, and there's some really good wide receivers in the rest of the pack, but these two I think are, are just something a little bit different. And um, I, I do this sort of like analytical process and I'm like, I'm putting prospects in probabilities and these two, uh, I think, have a pretty good probability of, of being great NFL wide receivers. And so, uh, to me, I I would even uh, advocate for uh, you could even switch Drake May and Malik Neighbors. I think that highly of Malik Neighbors to t- to maybe even potentially take him over over a quarterback. Um, and so, uh, I, I do think that Malik Neighbors deserves to be in that third, fourth, fourth pick range. Yeah, and I think that that's a clear top four for me and I agree with everything you're saying now some people are talking up this 105 as as being part of that tier with with the other four where where are you going to go here and and do you agree that it's a tier of five or are you sticking to that tier of four I think it's a tier of uh four and then um probably eight maybe so like I think there's another drop at at potentially eight ish um, or seven, seven, eight ish, but yeah, I think that the tier four or these four players is a is a tier for me. Um, now I, I'm going to pick one that maybe isn't necessarily as chalk, but I do think that you can kind of order these top eight sort of how you want them. But I'm going to go Brock Bowers here for the fifth pick. Um, there's a there's another QB out there that I think gets picked. There's another wide receiver out there that I think is is pretty high on, on people's boards. Uh, but I, I just think that Brock Bowers, um, uh, you know, has, you know, everything you'd want in a fantasy producing tight end. I think there's this resurgence of youthful tight ends that are coming to the league where it's been sort of this, you know, two or th- I'm sorry, three or four tight ends that have sort of owned the tight end market for a while. I think now you now's the time you have to get your your younger tight end 
and you can hold him for a while. Brock Bowers is one of the better tight end prospects that we've seen. I think he'll go um, in the first round, early in the first round, um, at least in the top half of the first round, uh, although I have been wrong before on that. Um, But uh, from a production perspective, when you look at Brock Bowers, um, since he started at school, he's been producing at an incredible level um, to the point where we, we haven't seen that type of production out of tight end in a very long time. Um, he, he meets uh, most of my thresholds. I'd say the one threshold that is a little bit off is, um, his weight, his size, um, um, weight, but, uh, I don't think that that is a concern for him. Uh, I think he'll play, he'll get a lot of opportunity to catch passes in the NFL. And I think, especially in your tight end premium leagues, this isn't, uh, this isn't set up as being a tight end premium, but, um, in your tight end premium leagues, I think he does deserve to get to that, that close to around this range, at least in the top eight. Um, and for a position where we typically haven't emphasized very much, I think uh, this is one of those uh, really uh, top end prospects that has a good shot at producing and producing early in the NFL. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, any time a tight end is seeing targets per route run number north of 30, it's, uh, you know, 30%, it's, it's alarming. Uh I think as a as a Georgia Bulldog fan, I'm I'm always going to be a, a Brock Bowers fan. I think he's been absolutely phenomenal. I think look, the ability that he shows all over the field in college is like no other prospect I've seen. And yes, I know we talked about Kyle Pitts when he was coming out. He was a wide receiver playing tight end, and I think that where Brock Bowers is different is that. He is a wide receiver playing tight end, but he is also a running back with the ball in his hands. Like, you know, there's not many tight ends that get used as often as he was on end arounds and jet sweeps and things like that. It was a case of Georgia wanting to get the ball in his hands as often as they could. And I I love him. I'm, I'm not someone that can bring myself to spend up on tight ends in rookie drafts. So I don't know if I can go here but i've certainly got him in this tier with the next few players that we're we're going to talk about for me though at the 106 i'm going to go with Jaden daniels now if you said to me in two years time Jaden daniels was out of the league not on fantasy relevant radars and a complete bust i'd believe it if you said to me that Jaden daniels was the number one player in all of dynasty in terms of valuation. I'd believe it. Like his absolute range of outcomes is like, I don't think there's ever been a prospect that's had a wider range of outcomes. His ceiling is incredible. You know, this is a guy that the rushing numbers almost don't look real. Um, You know, it's, what are we talking this year? He had 3,800 passing yards, 1,250 rushing yards. He had 50 total touchdowns in 12 games. Like, that's absolutely bonkers. What he did this year was incredible. Do I have serious concerns about his ability to operate from the pocket? Yes. Do I have serious concerns about him being able to essentially operate within structure and, you know, operate a traditional passing scheme? Yes. But if you're going to put him in an RPO heavy scheme where he doesn't really have to make reads, he can go one to two and then get out in space and run and, you know, create, he could be phenomenal. Um, So, yeah, I think at this point in the draft, I've got to go pure upside. It could be a bust. It could be a wasted pick, but let's, let's swing for the fences. What do you think? That's the upside play. Um, You know, a prospect that in my opinion, there, he had, uh, wasn't really even on my radar coming into this season and just had one of the best college football seasons a QB has ever had. And uh, the, so the rise is, is pretty amazing. The way that my process works, though, is I look for um, early declares and early, early produces, at least producing at certain age-adjusted thresholds. And although Jaden Daniels did hit on a couple things his first two years, which is maybe kind of unique for five-year guys, um, he is a fifth-year guy. Um, and so, yes, his fifth-year season was was pretty remarkable. But it, it, he obviously will get weighed down just because of his age and, and how long it took him to get to this point of, of clear dominance. 
Um, I, I do worry a little bit about his his size. Um, he's got sort of a lower BMI. Um, he's he's a tall guy, but he's got a lower BMI. Which you know, if if we're gonna if we're gonna bet on him to be the Konami code guy that um, that rushes for a ton of yards, uh, we just have to be careful. Um, uh, you know about um, betting at all in a guy that is is, is, is pretty thin and, and might not hold, hold up to that durability. Although there's no signals, he went through this last season and and uh, there weren't weren't any signals that that um, you know is a is a major red flag. But it's just sort of one of those watch items to to be conscious about. And last year we had Anthony Richardson, which the I think the the probabilities uh, of of what could happen with him were were pretty wide in terms of like taking upside shots, but he was, he was three years and he never really had that like great season. At least Jane Daniels had uh, like that phenomenal season, um, even though he is that fifth year guy. So I don't know, there's like, at least you've seen, seen it before. It's not just like picking little pieces and parts of games to, to make it work. You've seen one season of, of pure like fantasy greatness and, and crazy upside. So I, you know, I see where fantasy managers are. Uh, I, that's that's who I would have picked at five if I didn't pick Brock Bowers. So uh, you know I, I still feel like we're still kind of in that same range of of this is about where he should go. I think the interesting thing that I've seen in doing some of these mocks is that some people have Jane Daniels over Drake May, and that's like a legitimate argument that people are having. I do not have them in the same tier. I have Caleb and Drake in tier one and Jane Daniels in tier two. Uh, but we're starting to see in a lot of mock chaps where we're because of that upside, that upside push, Jaden's going before Drake um, in a lot of drafts. And I think we we talked about the quarterback order in last week's mock draft with Pat Smith, Pat Fitzmorris, which if you're watching, you haven't checked out, go ahead and check it out below. Um, but for me in a one quarterback league, I could absolutely get on board with that. And I think that in a one quarterback league, I would probably consider drafting Jaden Daniels over somebody like Drake May because the you know the potential upside is what I'm chasing and if if he busts it's a one quarterback league I can go and find another quarterback kind of thing in a super flex league I can't get on board with spending that top three four draft capital on a guy that could completely bust in a year so I I'm tending to lean towards what I consider the much safer prospect in in Drake May. But yeah, I think certainly if if Jaden Daniels, you know, does show out at the combine, if he does get that top three draft capital, I wouldn't be shocked to see Jaden Daniels definitely going QB2. And as you said, you know, I think there could be potentially some people that are suggesting he's the QB1 in this draft. But we're now heading over to the 107. So, uh, so Jay, where are you going to go for us here? I'm going to go Roma Dunze um, out of Washington. He's uh, 6'3", 216 pounds, 27 BMI, just uh, an incredible frame. Um, he is, you know, my prospect is the early declares and, and early producers. He is not one of those things where he gets up in my model is, is draft capital. So the way that my model works is I have like 40% weight on draft capital, 20% weight on on production, um, age adjusted production metrics, and then fifteen uh, percent on age, and then there's a smattering of other things like size and and athleticism and um, PFF uh, grades and, and film grades and and um, and metrics. And um, but the main main piece of that is draft capital. Uh, and and Rome Rome's getting very very high draft capital. Uh, I know J- Dan Jeremiah has him as his number one wide receiver this year um so far uh and so uh, i'm sorry the the number one receiver behind marvin harrison so it's number two wide receiver but um uh yeah just a just a great great uh wide receiver and he the the thing that i would say that makes me a little bit lower on him than others is that it took four years for him to get to those production levels that 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 i was looking for those age adjusted production levels um, and so in year one, two, three, he didn't hit those. Um, and it didn't happen until year four. The The part that saves him is that first round draft capital. And I went back and I looked at a lot of um, wide receivers that are the four year wide receivers that get drafted in the first round. And a lot of those guys, the ones that ended up being successful, 
they did have the production in especially in years two and three and rome doesn't have that the one that i could find that was that had a kind of similar production pro- profile and then the, the draft capital range was the brandon iuke comp which iuke didn't really do anything for three years and then his fourth year he goes and has a great year um and then gets uh mid first round draft capital um that's kind of a little bit like what what Roma Dunze's production profile looks like, and so there's 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 at least one kind of example of where maybe it works, and maybe a lot of examples where it doesn't work. Um, but um, but uh, you know, a very high first round draft capital, uh, very intriguing physical profile. Um, so I think I, you got to take a take a shot on him at the uh, with the seventh pick here. Yeah. He he's the player that I'm struggling with the most in this process. So I try and sit down and I try and watch at least three games of every prospect before I get into kind of my analytics side. And the film I really liked, you know, he is a big bodied, really good route runner. He's competent at the catch point. I think he's, you know, a contested catch specialist. I think when you consider his size and his, he is a bit of a long strider. His route running's phenomenal based on that. But then, you, as you said, you look at, you know, my model absolutely hates him. That age-adjusted production is just non-existent. You know, this is a guy that didn't break two yards per route run until his, his junior season. Even then, the production wasn't phenomenal. It was still, you know, that third year was good. Yes, this last year he's been amazing. But then how much do we weigh in the fact that he's also catching passes from potentially a first round pick quarterback that's boosted that whole offense. And it's like, I can never weigh in. Do what, do we ding him because he's only produced with a star quarterback or do we give him an excuse because he didn't produce when there was question marks at quarterback. And I've never quite decided which way to go and, and how to approach that. But yeah, he's, he's somewhat of an enigma to me. I think, there's going to be somebody in every draft that falls in love with him. My my Calvin Johnson theory of people overdrafting big bodied fast wide receivers because they're looking for the next Calvin Johnson. I think he's the prime example this year. Maybe another LSU wide receiver that we might talk about in a little bit. I think that he's going to have someone in every draft that loves him and falls in love with him and pushes him into that tier with Harrison and, and neighbors. And to me, he, he, he doesn't belong there. I think what's interesting is we're we're kind of agreeing here, but we're um, I don't know I don't know how far you'd have him down from here, but I, I feel like um, there's there's a lot of these mock drafts with Rome is going much higher. Um, uh, maybe switch Bowers with with Rome uh, or or uh, you know, um, and and uh, there's a lot of pressure upward, and we're I think yeah. maybe in alignment here in saying that we're kind of holding tight and, and pushing it down and making sure it doesn't get uh, the, the, the hype doesn't go too far uh, yeah. without saying that he's not a, he's, he's a decent wide receiver. He had a great phenomenal year and um, he'll be a, he'll probably be most likely be a high first round pick. And so uh, to that extent, we, you know, you, you got to take him here in the first round. It's just um, we're not pushing for him to be anywhere close to Malik neighbors or pushing him up further on the draft board is what I'd say. Yeah, exactly. That. I, I would have, 100% taking him here as well. But for me, there's a drop down to take him here. But um, but yeah, at, at the 108, and it feels like I'm intrigued to hear who you think is in this tier, because I know you said you felt there was a tier at eight. I'm going to take a guy that is probably a little bit lower on a lot of guys' draft boards, but I'm falling in love with. And it feels like he's, he's fast becoming my guy in, in terms of Xavier Worthy. I think you put on the tape, Elite separator. I mean, he is crazy fast. I've I've read a report that he ran a 10 500 meters at, at age 17. I mean, how he's not running track in the Olympics, I don't know if that's true. Uh, he produced consistently the seconds he stepped on the field. You know, you talk about age adjusted production, he ticks that box. I think that there will be some that will knock his size, but this is a guy that's shown the ability to line up as an X in an offense, defeat press coverage. I don't think he's going to be asked to do that in the NFL. I think that teams are going to be able to line him up out of the slot, use him in motions, get him that free release. 
and I think that there's a world where he could be that undervalued because of his size fantasy asset that I think could blow up. I've got very few question marks over him as a prospect. I know what he is. I know what he's going to be at the next level. Whereas I've got serious question marks about pretty much everyone else on the board of Aiden at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I, I have noticed Xavier worthy falling um, a lot of times out of the first round. Yeah, absolutely. And that was going to be one of my points in this draft because I had him in, in the first round, not in this slot, but in the <laughs> first round. Uh, and so, um, you know, my point on Xavier Worthy is that um, he kind of hit everything that we kind of needed to see from him his first year in, in the NCAA. Um, and he's been a, a fairly good producer year two and year three, but not like – uh, people like to see, you know, the the wide receivers that are the, at the top of all these like important categories, and he's he has good numbers. He's just not at the very top. Um, and the way that my process works on these age adjusted thresholds is it's just the threshold, right? So you just have to get above a certain age level. So like each year you're in the in college, that level gets a little bit higher, and you just want to be sort of like above there. Do you need to be number one or even top five in each every single metric every year? No. And and we we saw him do what he needed to do his first year. What you'd like to see in a, for a prospect is sort of that year over year project project, um, you know, like getting better each year. And we definitely don't see that because he had his first year was his best year. Um, and then it gets, um, you know, uh, his second year was a little bit of a step off. His third year was a little bit of a step off. Um, from what he what we saw in that first year, but year three and year two, like if you actually look and dive into it, it's they're not bad. It's a good good production. Um, we just forget because we saw maybe our eyes were adjusted to what he can do in year one, and then we're like, what what happened in year two and three? Why why did this why did this fall off? And and uh, a lot of times we take what happened just this last year and use that to 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 make our our projections out for the next you know, for how good a NFL player you'd be like. But I would, I would strongly advocate that you use the full body of work. Here's one, two, and three here looking at Xavier Worthy. And then, um, and then make your decision based on looking at all three years um, and, and that production over three years. And, and so where uh, he, I see him falling into uh, the second round. I think he's in that, like, you know, high single digits area of the first round for me. And so I like, I like the pick. Um, exciting to hear that you like it there. So we're, <laughs> I'm intrigued now. So you said there was a, a top eight, a tier at the eight. I feel yeah. like there's one name that is going around here in mock drafts. And I'm intrigued to see if, if that's the name you're going to grab here. Well, yeah. I, I'm not sure if this is the name you're talking about, but my eight is Troy Franklin. Yeah. Um, yeah so that, that was, that was okay, who I was, is, okay. was hinting at. Yeah. I've seen Troy Flake. I've seen um, the one of the other wide receivers that we haven't selected yet as one of those names that that people are getting all excited about. I think you may have alluded to him as the other LSU wide receiver, <laughs> um, but Troy Franklin to me is is somebody that's sleeping on out now. Xavier Worthy. Uh, so for my for my draft capital projections, I use this thing called the a mock draft da database. Um, it's a free thing. It basically aggregates all the mock drafts from all the the, the um, experts out there into sort of one place to go and look and see we'll get on average where these guys are going now xavier worthy his mock mock draft numbers have been have been falling down to the point where it's it's got him in the second round now and then troy franklin has moved from the second round into the first round now so when i go and put that in the model and i, I give Tra troy franklin the first round draft capital uh, it, it puts him above Xavier Worthy just because of just because of that. But another wide receiver that really produced really well, um, people will call, question his weight. Um, but um, from an age adjusted pro, uh, uh, production metrics, we're talking about production that was in this in the realm of what Marvin Harrison and Malik Neighbors did um, for two years. Um, and it's not as high. But it's two years of that kind of production on a um, weighted dominator, reception yards per team pass attempt, DPR per play, um, two years of meeting those age-adjusted thresholds. So production, really good. 
Um, uh, yeah, draft capital in the first round, maybe not as high as where Marvin Harrison and neighbors and Roma Dunes are going. Um, the, the one, the concern there is, is the weight it's 187 pounds. You know, we'll go, we'll get a, a better barometer of that. I'm just pulling that from, um, the, the school's website. Um, but it, you know, it does put him in that category of maybe being like, uh, you know, like sort of the Devonta Smith argument where, uh, you have an incredible producer, but this this guy that has a BMI that's below 25, well below 25, that it might actually be a problem. And you you can go and see what Devonta Smith has done um, to to make your argument on the other side. Uh, but it is just sort of like this watch item that you can have. But when you look at all those metrics I told you before, yards per route run, um, the A dot looks good. Uh, it's just uh, across the board uh, from a production perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Now, um, uh, his PFF receiving grade was just slightly lower than than Marvin Harrison's in this year. So he had Marvin Harrison had an 89.6, Troy Franklin had an 87.3. I mean, these these production numbers and grades and film grades and stuff like that, it's all like kind of close to to that Marvin Harrison and and um, and Malik Neighbors um, perspective. So that's why combine that with the first round draft capital uh, maybe there's some issues on um, like the size profile of him and that might weigh a little bit on my rigs but I, I just feel like um, Troy Franklin's star is kind of pointed up here in terms of you know getting everything to come into a line um, from a from a from a prospect model yeah and I I like him I think I guess my concern with him is that I think he <laughs> His highs are really high. I think he's probably got some of the best highlights of any prospect in this class. But the problem is, is that if when you watch him, I think he probably tell, can tell if somebody's just watching the highlights or if somebody's actually watching whole games because he disappears for stretches. And I just think that that's not a player that I have confidence he's going to be able to transition to the NFL that you know can go whole quarters without even realising that he's still out there. I think that I have some questions about his ability to run a nuanced route tree. I think he is a long strider. I think he's fantastic when he's running those, you know, simple cut routes. So when he's running nines, when he's running posts, I think he's fantastic because he's not having to slow down his stride length. He's not having to drop his weight and make a cut. If I, I have real concerns when he's running comebacks, when he's running a dig or, or anything like that, where he's having to actually break down and cut because he is a long strider. He takes a long time to slow down. And, you know, it's like driving a car, slow into the corner, fast out. He is slow to get to the corner, which means he can't be fast out. So, yeah, I I I like him, but I have real concerns over how much he's going to command volume at the next level. I think he could be one of these that's, for an NFL team, really valuable because he does stretch the field. He is going to have those high-value touches and he can be, you know, a big play weapon and, and turn a game in a second. But I, for a fantasy perspective, it might be one of these that, you know, is is going to burn you on, you on your bench and have four catches for 100 yards and two touchdowns one week and then you know three targets and one catch and no yards the next week kind of thing i just don't know if he's going to be able to command the significant volume that i need for the high fantasy ceiling that i'm looking for yeah i don't i don't know about all the the tape stuff i'll i'll trust you on that i <laughs> i i don't know how to watch tape and um don't know how to to break that down so i believe you on that um but I would just I would just say like the his weighted dominator reception yards per team pass attempt were were significant enough that he was a big enough part of the offense on an aggregate on a total level um, that it would signify that maybe he could do that in the NFL. So in year two his dom weighted dominator was twenty five in year three his weighted dominator is thirty one. So um, that's 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 meeting those thresholds and his reception yards per team pass attempt in year two was around two and in year three it was just under three so it's like it's like he's he's a big part of the the Oregon's offense for two years 
Um, and and maybe you might be right. Maybe those came in chunks or there were parts of games where, you know, you could be let down. And from a fantasy man- manager, when you're looking at like consistency of, of points per game and stuff like that, maybe that is a problem. So I definitely hear you on that. And, uh, you know, he is we're getting we're picking him in t- in, in uh, pick nine here. Right. So, um, yeah, still, we're still pretty good. Still pretty good wide receiver. Absolutely. And we're at that point where we're shooting for upside, aren't we? So, you know, there's 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 a clear ceiling there where if he can command the volume, he could be fantastic. And at this point in the draft, that's that's always what I'm shooting for. So uh, I'm up now at the 110. So I'm going to this is funny because I feel like I'm drafting guys that I don't particularly love. But um, I'm going to go and draft Keon Coleman. Um, he's a player that I'm really struggling with right now. And there are bits that I like. There are absolutely bits that I like. He is fantastic with the ball in his hand, you know, big bodied, but he is a terrible route runner. And I think that there is, if you watch him, there's that size, speed, athleticism. It's back to the Calvin Johnson theory where I think he's going to get boosted up because he's got those, you know, athletic traits, athletic measurables that people are going to lust after. But it was part of my issue with somebody like Jonathan Mingo last year, where I don't think he's a good enough route runner to get that athleticism out. And he he takes extra steps into cuts. I think he's there's there's enough in there that I've got serious concerns about him drafting. But at this point in the draft, when we're shooting for upside, if he can put that athleticism on the field and that can translate, like we were saying about Troy Franklin, there there is absolutely a high ceiling there. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree with what, a lot of what you're saying. And I think um, the, the size profile uh, in a similar vein to Roma Dunze is, is very intriguing. Um, and, um, you know, he's, he's still getting that first round buzz in the NFL. Well, I, I do agree, though. The, the issue that I have is sort of that, that production profile. And, um, usually I like to see like a wide receiver, um, you know, hit some of that over time. He did hit some stuff in year two, but he was missing it in year three. Year three is the the year that everybody got to know him and it wasn't his best year. Year two um, was his best year. Um, and so that, and that's just from my perspective, a little interesting that, uh, you know, when, when I'm looking at this analytical profile, I'm looking at you know, weighted dominator, reception yards per team, pass temp, DPA per play, going across the line on on things. Year two for him was actually a lot better uh, year for him than than year three. Um, yeah. So I, I I do think that uh, I'm sensing that in the the community that he does seem to be falling a bit. Um, you know, falling into round two ish. Um, I think he's the kind. Of- He's the kind of player that I feel like once we get to that combine and he weighs in, he measures, he runs a 40, that's when he's going to jump back up. And I think yeah. that it's people that, as you said, are looking at the the raw numbers, you know, he, he he's coming out off the back of a year where he had 1.74 yards per route run. Like, that's a terrible number. Um, and I do think that once we get to that combine, the hype will then build and people will go, this guy could be amazing. And that's the point at which he'll probably get back to, to where he was a month ago. So we say, yeah. And you just, you just worry. Um, there's, there's like a red flag to his profile where like, this is, this could be a pretty boom bust type profile um, just because um, of that fall off in production in, in year three. And, um, and so that, that would just be like a worry item. I would, I, the only, the only thing is that I would say is like, you know, taking him at the back end of the first round or into the second round, that makes a lot of sense. Falling in love with him and pushing him up into the top six or top eight. That's where we need to step back and say, okay, um, that's, that's too far. That's too much. Um, he's not, he's not at that level. Um, so just, you know, when, when that combine hype comes, um, that's, that's when we need to hold, put on our brakes and, and remember the production profile for a minute. Yeah, 
Absolutely, absolutely. So where where are we going to go with the one eleven here, Jay? I think it's going to be a standoff between me and you about how long we can go without something <laughs> a running back. <laughs> so I'm going to go. I'm just going to keep it going. I'm going to go Brian Thomas Jr. Um, this is this is what another sort of upside type profile. Um, he's he does have he's six four, two hundred five pounds. My hope is that that weight is a little bit higher than that. I'd love for it to be like above two ten ish. That's where that's where I'm going to like hope that he like you know bulks up and and tests well at the combine and measures in well but this wide receiver had a fantastic third year um really didn't do much of anything in year one and two but year three um he he broke out and typically i'd really want to see um a breakout in year two uh but we did not get that from brian thomas jr so there's there's risk in the production profile but he is he had an excellent year three he's an early declare and he's getting first round draft capital I love love those 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 things. That's what that's what grades really high at my model, and and it's sort of that puts you in a higher probability of, of doing well in the NFL and, and and scoring points in the NFL. So so I like that. You know, uh, some some highlights this this year. Uh, his reception yards per team pass attempt on a game games adjusted basis, so uh, a games played basis, was three point seven eight this year for year three. His weighted dominator was a 0.38, and his EPA per play was a 1.29. Those are all really phenomenal um, um, pieces for a wide receiver to have in any year. Um, he had it in his third year without doing too much anything his, his first two years. So, you know, there there is there is that concern. That's why he's that's why he's not at the very, very top of this board. It's it took him a while to get started, but he still meets the qualification of being that early to Claire. It just um, just didn't have it over the full three years or even two years of that. They just, he just had the one. His yards per route run was uh, 2.6 last year. Yeah. Um, so that, that's a pretty good yards per round. It just it just looks good. There's lots of stuff to like here. I have not looked at the film as closely as I'm sure that you have, and you might have something to say about um, you know looking at his film. But um, from looking at the numbers, it kind of looks like a pretty good profile worthy of, of, of being selected here um, in the first round. Yeah, I think, you know, it feels like there's a lot of guys like this in this class. He is a size, speed demon, you know, big bodied, yeah, a little bit skinnier than some of the other guys, but he's blazing fast. My big concern is that I do think he is somewhat of a one-trick pony. You know, he he does like to go deep and, and there's not much nuance in terms of the route running, he struggles to create separation underneath. He is fast, but not quick, if that makes sense. So he is blazing fast in a straight line, but lacks the agility and, and the movement skills, I think, to create that separation. Yes, he, he posted fantastic numbers this last year, but the target targets per route run number was still sub 20%, which is a little bit of a concern. I know he was sharing an offense with Malik Neighbors and you know he was commanding an awful lot of those targets, but... I do think that Brian Thomas is one of those guys that is a bit of a one-trick pony. He could potentially be end up being a, a better in best ball type. I would like to have seen him run a wider variety of routes, shall we say, in college. But I feel like I'm saying this for every receiver in this range. There is absolutely upside there, and you know there is a ceiling that he could be fantastic. Um, I just don't know if I'm quite ready to get on board with it. Um, so with with the last pick in the first round, I'm going to again. I'm scroll down a little bit here. Uh, oh wow, I'm scrolling down quite a lot. I'm going to go with Michael Penix. I've got some questions around. I think his you know the injury track record is obviously fairly massive. I've don't know if I've ever seen a player that's started games in six years in college. But he is one of the most accurate passes I've seen at the college level. He cannot create out of structure. But if you're going to stick him in a RPO heavy, you know, if you stuck him in Miami in a tour style offense, he could be phenomenal for fantasy. I think he is so switched on and such a high processor from the pocket, both pre and post snap that I think there is a world where he could be a really effective kind of QB2 for fantasy. I don't think he's got that upside and that ceiling because he he 
is not a rushing. <laughs> he's got zero rushing ability, zero ability to create our structure. But if he lands in the right situation, I think he could be a competent fancy quarterback. Yeah, um, I'm. This is where we. This is the first time we've really disagreed here. I'm going to push back and say, um, I actually wouldn't draft Michael Penix in the first two rounds of his oh, wow. draft. Okay. Um, I would say. I th- well, let's see what happens because if he's a first round quarterback, a first round drafted quarterback, I'm gonna have to change my tune. But I do think that um, there's enough issues there that I I think he falls out of the first round of the NFL draft. And the way that my process works is, um, you know, uh, in order to get draft capital for a quarterback, you got to be first round. Um, and if you're not, then there's a big ding in your in your profile. And I. I Personally, at this moment, I don't see Michael Penix as that first round um, quarterback. Um, the, you know, I've kind of talked out my process a few times here, but like, you know, early declares, early early production. Um, at least like production is played for six years. <laughs> this is this is a six year guy that's you know had injury issues and um, <clears throat> and um, you know. You know, it, typically in these like longer term prospect guys, um, you know, say you're five years in or six years in, you'd want to see that like age adjusted, meeting age adjusted thresholds for at least like two years, hopefully. Um, you know, so if that's in in a six year guy perspective, if that's year five and six, that's okay. If if it's year four and six, that's fine. If it's a fifth year guy, maybe it's four and five, and they didn't get in the field. In Jane Daniels's case. Um, he's a fifth year guy. He he had two pretty decent years and there were some like smidgens of, you know, stuff that he was able to do in year one and two, where you can find pieces where it kind of fits a little bit of what you're looking for. Penix, uh, he really didn't meet any of the thresholds until this last year. Uh, and so my production scores are, are pretty down for him. Um, and the age scores are down. Uh, the, basically the, the thing that gets him, there is that he might be a first round quarterback. Um, his film grades are pretty good. And like some of that advanced stat stuff is, is pretty good, but um, yeah, I, it's, it's a tough slog for me. Yeah. I would say I'm, I'm basing this on him being a mid to late first round pick. Um, I'm with you in order to be a first round pick in Superflex draft. You've got to be a first round pick in the NFL draft. I'm, I'm not drafting any quarterback here that's that's not there. If you've made it, we're 50 minutes in. We've just finished the first round. Hit that subscribe button. We're going to have mock drafts coming to you almost every week as we head up to the NFL draft. So stick around. Hit that subscribe button. We'll have more content coming your way. We're going to fire through the second round a little bit quicker now. Uh, try, try and get through this. Um, you're up at the 201, Jay. Where are you going here? Okay, I hear you. I'm going to go a little bit quicker here. Uh, first one, uh, first pick of the second round, I'm going to go J.J. McCarthy, quarterback, Perfect. Michigan. Um, what is it you for, love me, about him? for me, it's uh, I got J.J. and Bo Nix as both first-round quarterbacks. Um, J.J. McCarthy hits a lot of the advanced st- stats that I look for and production metrics that I look for. He's a, th- uh, a third-year early declare guy. There's um, uh, 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 lots of theory about um, him not being used um, very much in the Michigan offense. Uh, I would say they kind of underutilized them, focused more on the run game, and then asked him to be very efficient. Um, It is an unknown whether if the volume goes up for him, if he's able to take that efficiency and then keep doing the things that he was able to do in college. Um, That's an incredible unknown. But I do think if he's that young guy that gets the first round draft capital, and um, even if he is a, look, a, a project for somebody, um, I think he's a worthy of fantasy selection. Yeah, he, he's my 2024 Rorschach test. I think you see what you want with him. I think if you, you know, he's got absolutely elite traits, but there is some rough edges that need rounding to his game. So I think you you can see with him whatever you want to see, quite frankly. Um I am going to finally break the uh, the running back oh, uh, fall. I don't know if I'm going to take the guy that, uh, that would probably be your RB1, but I'm going Brendan Allen. I think that as a two-down running back, he's the best in this class. And I think that the questions of him as a receiver, we've seen with other Wisconsin running backs that 
have then come to the NFL and showed competency in the passing game. I think that he is a guy that will translate immediately for 60% of the time on the NFL field. And I think that there's enough ability. You know, he, he is a natural hands catcher. He's not a natural route runner, but I think he can be utilised almost like Derek Henry. Every time he is used on a screen or a check down, it looks awkward. It looks uncomfortable, but then he gets the ball in his hand in space and it looks fantastic. Um, I think he's not Derek Henry as an athlete. He's not Derek Henry as a runner, but he is good enough that, he could potentially have that three down workload within his range of outcomes. Are you a fan of Brain Lan? I am. I have him as my first running back. The problem is, is that I have two tiers, one tier, two tier, and then tier three. And that's where my first running back is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just that for me, this is a down running back class. Um, I have all these QBs running back, all these QBs wide receivers, and even a tight end well above of, of him. And, and that's kind of how I'm, I'm thinking about it. Whereas maybe like um, in some classes, I'd have a running back up in tier one or tier two. Um, Braylon Allen is the leader of a group of tier three running backs, in in my opinion. Um, and and he was he's my number one. I think what's interesting is like he hits a lot of the production metrics that I'd want to see. But then every single person that I that I that I hear that watches film is like, uh, I don't I don't really like it. I don't think this is going to translate. I don't think this is good. Um, and so it's really like um, uh, that debate about like having all the production, but maybe not, you know, getting either draft capital or getting, um, you know, uh, the sign off from the film guys, the guys that know what they're doing in terms of watching the film uh, makes him for an interesting prospect this season. Um, Where yeah, so I'm going to the two or three. I'm going to go Bo Nix here. Uh, Bo Nix is probably my my. Uh, even though we have Jaden Daniels in here as uh, uh, a fifth-year guy, Bo Nix is probably my favorite fifth-year guy um, uh, at at quarterback. Um, and you know, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I'd ever take him on, in front of Jaden Daniels because of Jaden Daniels' rushing ability. But what Bo Nix was able to do this year in terms of just looking at the metrics, uh, it actually looked re- like a really great season, and he's up there with Jaden Daniels and Michael Penix. Uh, and he's also getting that first round draft buzz. So I do think that um, uh, Bo Nix is, you know, in the Debbie community, one of those guys that kind of gets chuckled at a little bit because he had, you know, one good year at Auburn and then it, he kind of faded away and then had to transfer and then he had another good year. And then, you know, some say that he's a product of the offense that he was and uh, that they had ran in at Oregon. Uh, but, Really, the the numbers all speak for themselves. It, it looks looks like a pretty good uh, profile, except for the fact that he's a fifth year guy. If he w- if he was a four year guy and had some of these this profile, he'd he'd probably be up in that first round for me. But um, you know, we are doing super flex, so there is still that emphasis on the quarterbacks, first round quarterbacks. I think there probably will probably be five of them. Um, and JJ and Nex would be the the two that I put in there, and Penix would fall out of the first round for me. Um, and not six, but that you know, if we're in, if we're playing super flex and you get a QB draft in the first round, they're probably going to play him at some point. And just having that positional value of of a guy, a first round quarterback that's that's going to play, um, is important for me in super flex. Yeah, I, I like Bonix. I think he's I've, he's kind of solid and unspectacular. I think he doesn't have an elite trait, but he's kind of jack of all trades, if that makes sense. I would say watching him at Auburn and watching him at Oregon is like two different players like if you put those on and told them they weren't the same person I'm not sure you'd believe it because what he did in each offense is is completely completely different quite frankly um I'm gonna go next here the 204 so I'm gonna take Jonathan Brooks now I appreciate he he is injured um we have got that uh you know the ACL concern but I think if he didn't have that he'd probably be the only back that we'd be talking about maybe cracking into those sort of top two tiers. I think he's a phenomenal one cut runner. You know, he I've said last week, he reminds me of Arian Foster. I think he's just that guy that has got the patient, sees a gap, one cut and he's gone. I think he's competent in the past game. He's not an elite route runner, but I think again, mainly on checkdowns. I know you're going to say that the age adjusted production isn't there, but let's be honest, when you're playing behind Bijan and, and Roshan Johnson, I think we can uh, maybe cut him a bit of slack. 
No, I think for running backs, I, I don't necessarily need to see it in the first year, maybe even not the second year. I mean, I prefer to have it, but to me, the profile like feels uh, a little bit like uh, from a wide receiver perspective, like uh, like Brian Thomas Jr., where like you didn't see the first two years, but year, the year three, you he just like crushed it and crushes everything. And so from that perspective, to me, that that's, that's pretty good. Uh, you know, combining that with the early declare, it makes – it makes a lot of sense. I I have Jonathan Brooks as my RB three in this class, so I'm I'm pretty high on him. I think. And uh, where are you going to go now? Here, two hundred five. We're going to see your your RB two off the board. We'll see. Uh, no, it's going to be Adonai Mitchell, uh, wide receiver, Texas. Um, I am noticing him as a guy that's rising in in these drafts. Um, he's getting selected above. Xavier Worthy above uh, Brian Thomas Jr. above a lot of these guys. Um, so it, it it's not it's not a perfect profile. This is mostly like the buzz that he's getting around the draft capital. Um, you know there are points to point out that like is is okay, but it it's a fairly risky upside pick. Um, you know he 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 doesn't look that great on a lot of this age adjusted basis. But um, you know, there's there's some things to like about his profile. The most important thing being that he's he's gonna probably go in the second round of the NFL draft. And those guys that go in the second round, a lot of those guys uh, can hit uh, if you have the right profile. And it, you know, there this this guy has an okay profile. It's it's not it's not perfect by any means. But um, you know, uh, I'll take a shot at the one another one of these upside wide receivers. Um, here in the in the second round yeah I, th- I think he's if you watch him he's got everything but the talent doesn't translate to production which I can't quite work out why you know really good route runner phenomenal agility his his ability in that short area quickness is is amazing but as you said he's he's been with some decent quarterbacks in some good programs at Georgia and Texas and and just sort of never really put it all together on the field so a guy I'm struggling with, but sort of, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with the value at this point in the draft. Um, I'm going to stick with with the running back position. I'm going to go Trey Benson here. I think that he is smooth, versatile, fantastic vision, really useful in the passing game. Um, he just lacks that kind of elite athleticism that I think, probably cats his ceiling but i think he's he's a solid kind of 1b with upside option in the nfl for me yeah uh i like the trey benson pick i'm gonna go for my next pick i'm gonna go audric estime okay uh this is a little bit non-chalk here but i think that audric's gonna be a guy that moves up uh people's draft boards um, he's 227 pounds with a 31.7 BMI. So he's a, he's a big fella. Um, he's getting third round draft capital buzz right now. Um, Jonathan Brooks, like sort of production style profile. So not much in year one and two, although there's a little bit more production in year two than, than Jonathan Brooks. But, um, the year three was, was a great year. Um, so you get the draft capital, you get the the, the um, production. The one area that you're not going to get with him at necessarily as much is the like pass catching piece of this. Um, so in fantasy, we're you know the the holy grail is have the the three down back that also is very involved in the in the receiving game. This is not. I don't think this is guy is Audric Estime is a, the 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 holy grail type running back. And but I do think that he's a a really great run of the football and and uh so far in this process given everything we looked at um uh looks like my running back too his yards per attempt this year was a 6.4 anything above six is pretty good his uh yards after contact per attempt this year is 4.27 he's averaged over four for his career um his missed tackles force per attempt this year was a, a, a over uh 30 um so a three point zero point three one, um, so like just kind of like even his elusive rating this year was one hundred one hundred twenty six, which my cutoff arbitrarily is kind of close to like one twenty five. So like he's putting all this these numbers up uh, um, uh, that 
that looked really good for the third year. Early declare, younger guy, um, and just meets a lot of the things that I look for. Yeah, I, th- I think my concern, I like him, but my concern is that pass catching. I think it, it kind of puts a real cap on his ceiling. I'm going to go and do something I, I don't normally do. I'm going to draft a tight end. I think Jatavian Saunders, if it wasn't for a certain guy coming out of Georgia, I think there'd be a hell of a lot of hype about him. I think he's phenomenal. He's an amazing athlete. He is a natural hands catcher. I think he's going to be useful as a fantasy asset because he's probably going to line up as a big bodied slot a lot of the time. I think for him to be a truly elite fantasy tight end, he needs to be able to line up in line and actually block because if he doesn't, teams are just going to run nickel and, and treat him as a wide receiver. I think if he can keep defenses honest, that they have to, you know, treat him as a tight end so that he gets those matchups. That's what's going to allow him to potentially be a, a superstar tight end because I think that is definitely within his round of outcomes. I like that pick. I think I think the the tight ends are Brock Bowers by a mile, and then I think Jay Tavian Sanders is really good. So like when when I analyze his profile, it kind of feels like um, last year what we saw from like like the Sam Laportas and the Michael Mayer, kind of like that range yep. of where where he is. Now who knows whether when he goes to the NFL if he gets the type of production that that Sam Laporta gets. But from a prospect <laughs> profile, it looks like like that kind of that kind of bucket of where he could potentially be so i love that and you're getting them in you kind of like mid to late end of the second so that's that's great i'm gonna go bucky irving here (laughs) sorry (laughs) uh i really like bucky irving uh you know i think this is uh like a really great uh profile he hits a lot of the production stuff is a three-year guy um the concern that a lot of people will bring up is he's under 200 pounds um, and so all those concerns that come with being under 200 pounds as a running back, you'll, you'll have those, but his production profile was absolutely phenomenal. Um, when you look at yards per team play, um, uh, like a backfield dominator rating, his receiving production has been really good. And in, in year three, it was like uh, 15% of, uh, percent of percent of team receptions. So, uh, I think, you know, people will get concerned with like, you know, a, a back under 200 um you know like his durability uh those types of concerns um him being a three down work harrison i'd say one thing that i noticed and i don't watch a ton of film but i do notice that he was a lot more like aggressive and run people over than i thought he was going to be for his size um and i even like mentioned that to on on a different place that i you know write for and stuff it's a <laughs> it was it was a bit surprising and shocking that like he was so um you know aggressive his his uh missed tackles force per attempt was a, a 0.36 remember audric estime his was a 0.31 this year um and irving uh bucky irving had a higher missed tackles force per attempt um which is which is phenomenal for somebody that's under 200 200 pounds and his elusive rating this year was 146 um which is well above where where Audric estimates is it's just and he has that receiving piece of it too so um you add all those things together and then you subtract sort of maybe your concerns with maybe being under 200 pounds and you and you get a pretty good running back i'd say all these guys that we've taken here at the running back position you can sort of pick which one you want um whether it's braylon allen Audric Estime, jonathan brooks bucky irving trey benson i think there's arguments to make all case for all of those guys it's just it and i think they're all kind of in a similar tier and so it's just kind of pick the pick the guy that you you like the best from here i think that's i couldn't have said it better myself i think that yeah. sums it up perfectly in that you know most classes were looking for that complete running back this class doesn't have it so it's almost like pick your flavor of what do you like do you want the guy that is you know incredibly explosive and can be a home run in, in Bucky Irving. Do you want the bigger bodied guy in Braden Allen or, or Drake Estime? Do you want the guy that if he lands in the right scheme could be super dynamic, but he's injured and Jonathan Brooks, it's, you know, it's almost like a pick your poison. What do you like? What type of player do you like? And and that's where you go. I, I love watching Bucky Irving. I think he's a phenomenal athlete. I think, as you said, he's, he runs bigger than he is. My concern is I don't know how many carries he's going to be able to take between the tackles in the NFL. But then, you know, we saw that last year, Devon Achain 
he basically didn't run between the tackles because the Dolphins only used him out in space. And, you know, if a team's going to look at that usage and and do something similar with Bucky Irving, yeah, he's fantastic. He, he can run guys over in space. It's just he's not going to run a linebacker over in, in the hole as such. Um, I'm going to go with the running back position again. I'm going to go Blake Corum. Um, it's undersized but phenomenal patience and vision. I think his ability to set up defenders is probably one of the best in the class. I think that he's competent in the passing game, but probably not really a value add. I don't know if he's going to be a full workload guy, but I think he's got that kind of 1B skill set that can kind of do a bit of everything be a nice competent and you know if he lands in a good home where there's an injury ahead of him he could be a really useful fantasy star so um yeah not not the the sexiest pick not the most exciting pick but actually it's kind of like at this point there's kind of solid value in, in going and grabbing him yeah i like that um i'm gonna go for my last pick i'm gonna go lad mcconkey out of georgia um not a great production profile but uh incredibly athletic uh, I think he, we're gonna. He's gonna surprise about how athletic he is. He's not just your sort of like um, typical white guy slot receiver. This guy is uh, like an upper end athleticism type of guy. Um, and so, um, you know, not a lot of like the age adjusted threshold production metrics that he hit, but he did hit like um, like PFF metrics um, that are, are are somewhat interesting to me. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's not a, like a high conviction type of name, but um, it, it's somebody I think that can can find a place to produce um, fairly well um, in the NFL if he gets that draft capital. And I think right now with my my senses are that he probably does get that at least third round draft capital. Yeah, I, I don't love him, but I think that with his agility, with his route run ability, you can absolutely see a role for him tomorrow in the NFL. And I think that that is a lot more than could be said for a lot of these other guys in this range. And I think that, you know, yeah, it might not be the highest ceiling pick. It might be a guy that's kind of a wide receiver four, wide receiver five at best and sort of sits, you know, could be a flex play maybe. But actually at the back end of the second round, that's probably a pretty good return on on that investment. Um, to round out the draft, I'm going to go... Uh, what am I going to do here? I'm going to go Jalen Polk. So I'm going to stick with the root runner thing. I love a good root runner. I think fluid root runner, sharp cuts, create separation with ease. Given his frame, he's phenomenal contested catch receiver. I think he's got great hands. He's He's better than you'd expect with the ball in his hands. The one concern is that I don't think he's an elite athlete. I think he's solid, but yeah, tick, ticks a lot of boxes and and could potentially carve out a role at the next level. Um, and had a pretty good year this last year. Let's be honest. Love it, love it. Perfect, and that rounds it out. That is the the two rounds done. Uh, Jay, remind everybody that's watching uh, where can they find you? Where can they find your work? Yeah, um, you can find me on Twitter at underscore Jason Stein. Um, my work, I do the Dynasty Investor Series at Football Guys, and I do a bunch of stuff for the Devery Rael, um, which is a Patreon that you can join if you wanted to. Um, and yeah, that's basically, reach out to me anytime. Um, go and look up uh, um, Jalen Wright, uh, running back. He's not in sleeper yet. Guys, go and watch this guy. Um, you know, to the extent that um, that Audric Estime and Jonathan Brooks had good seasons is third good third years this guy is kind of like in that similar vein of a riser and uh he might do well in the in the draft so um go and look at him but yeah you can you can hit me on twitter um anytime you want to and uh, football guys and, and the different rail perfect well as jay says go and check him out he's putting out some fantastic work if you are here you've made it an hour and quarter into the show you've enjoyed what you've looked Go and check out last week's show. We had the fantastic Pat Fitzmaurice on. We did a one QB mock draft. I'm going to be back later in the week with some buys and sells, but get ready for draft season. Come and check out those rookie prospects. We've got more videos coming over the next few weeks. 